Hello, this is The Jay Show, and this is Dr. Jay Smith here in London. I have brought the beautiful Sarah Foster <laughs> once again to come and share some of the research that you've been doing. This is your research, uh, looking at slavery, looking really at your own history, because this is part of your, uh, well, it's part of your ancestry. You have come from this whole line of slaves, and so because of that, it's been important to you, not only in your research, but uh, important to you to find your identity. And as we've been saying in the previous episodes, uh, this is something you thought was only a, a transatlantic problem. You thought that this is something that was specific to Europe, United States, South and North America, places like that, uh, you were not aware of the fact that this is also a real problem for Islam. Yeah, I mean, it's been an Islamic issue. Muslims have come to me and told me about my history of slavery and how I should really worry about it. And so I was intrigued to see what Islam had to say about slavery. And, and they always used to say, why are you a Christian? Because mm -hmm. it's a Christian problem. Uh, this is a uniquely a Christian problem. Islam has no problem with slavery. Yeah. Now we've gone through and we've talked about that. We've looked at some of the, Christi the, the biblical verses. We went through the Old Testament. Uh, we went through the New Testament. We'll be coming back to that as well in the example of Jesus Christ in the, in the future. But what I want to do now, and um, you've told me that you have some material on looking at the status of Islamic slavery. So we're going to move now to the whole Islamic world of slavery. Yes, so we're going to look at the Quran, we're going to look at some of the Hadith, and we're going to get a general picture of slavery in Islam, the okay. theological aspect. So we're going to look at the claims they make. Yes. All right, let's do that. And uh, let's go ahead and start with the Muslim apologetic. What is the Muslim apologetic? So in this case, when we're talking about the Muslim apologetic for slavery, we're talking about what Muslims say to defend um, Islam's stance on slavery from an Islamic perspective. So right, it's a defense right. of slavery in Islam by Muslims. Okay, that is their defense. And of course, you have been asking, you're one of the first ones that's actually pointing them and pushing them to this, to create an apologetic because of the fact that they have never talked about it. They never knew mm -hmm. about it. They didn't even know that this was a problem. They thought it was always uniquely a Christian problem, a European problem. So what is their, what are their, what is their defense? What are their excuses? What are they saying? Yeah, it's, it's quite sad. I mean, some people have spoken on this, but um, in the last couple of years, not so much now since we've started to do so much work on it, but in the last couple of years, Muslims started to s say to me, you have a problem, well, Christianity has a problem with slavery, whereas Islam came to abolish slavery. The whole purpose while Islam was brought is to abolish slavery. Okay, so their their view is just the opposite. Absolute opposite. It's um, it's Christian uniquely, not a problem with them. We came, the Prophet came, Muhammad came to take away and eradicate slavery. Now, what was so, so there was slavery though certainly wasn't there in Islam. We do know that, and you're yes. going to get into that. Yeah. The statistics are overwhelming when we look at that. What kind of slaves? What, what were the slaves that they're talking about? So the apologetic goes like this. Um, before Islam came, then people were sold into slavery. They would sell themselves or family members into slavery. Mm. It was so easy to get into slavery. But Islam came and it limited slavery to only two possibilities. You can only obtain slaves by um, prisoners of war. So if you are in war with another people, and um, you win that war, then they're captives or the people yeah. who lose, they can become slaves, they're prisoners of war. My, when I was living in Senegal, this was the, the my neighbors used to say this all the time. Yeah. Uh, that's right, we were the ones that defeated the other tribe, our tribe, the Tukulor, or our tribe, that usually is Tukulor, defeated the, the, uh, the wolves. Mm. And so we would take the wolves in slavery, and they were proud of this. And we have a long tradition of taking slavery, and we would sell them to the Arabs. <laughs> so this is very well known. Interestingly, that confronts the view that Alex Haley had uh, in Roots, the opening sequence in the old version of Roots, where they would just, you'd see these Europeans with white cutlasses going and enslaving people uh, against their will. In, yeah. in Historically, what we have found, it's almost always slaves of, uh, prisoners of war. Yeah. Internecine warfare. Well, there is an Ashanti um, person, and Ashanti is like kind of Ghanaian or that kind of side, who said, the way the, um, Islam raided and made slaves, he said, our ancestors never used to do that. <laughs> okay. So, um, um, so, I mean, the, 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 what was the name of the people you said? The Wolof and the Tukulor. The Tukulor. The Tukulor. The Fulani is maybe, another name for them. 
where they learnt that from. I don't know how long that practice has been going on. I don't know. But the, the Asante tribe said our ancestors never did that. Well, the Tukulo are the Fulani who you come are all over West Africa. Yeah. They are the nomadic ones, and they are the first were the first to become Muslims. Very distinct people. And the much Fulani. of it is because of the relationship with the Arabs from mm. Mauritania, mm. from the Moors up further nor northwest. But that's a whole other historical. <laughs> we're going to get into that later yeah. on. So prisoners of war is one way that you could be a slave. Yes. So prisoners of war, and then the second possibility is that you're born into slavery. Okay, child. Of yeah. a slave. Yeah, so okay. you're the child of a slave. So, and is and um, what would Islam say that everything else was abolished? Everything else was abolished. Only prisoners of war. If you're born into slavery, then you're a slave. But everything else is abolished. That's and their narrative. That's what they would say, and they would say in that way, um, by limiting the way you can get slaves, bit by bit, slavery was abolished because there would be less of them. So, what was the status of slaves then? What does the Quran say? Yep, let's go back to the Quran. I'm going to start off with Surah 2, Ayah 178. Okay. It says, O you who have believed, prescribed for you is legal retribution for those murdered. And it gives these categories it says, the free for the free, the slave for the slave, and the female for the female. Like with like. Like with like. Okay. So you notice that the slave is neither described as a male or described as a female. It's in a category by itself. Okay. So, um, so I mean, we can learn more about what that means in Surah 30, Ayah 22. That's the next one you want to go to. Yeah. Okay. So it says, of his angels, or sorry, of his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the diversity of your languages and your colors. So again, we see... Um, we see a distinction between languages and colors. And it doesn't seem like that much on the surface, but if we go into the study Quran, it mentions, it talks about Ibn Arabi. It talks about this and it says, so different, differentiate as he has differentiated and do not step beyond what has not been mentioned. And so it's talking about the fact that these are different types of humans. It says, on the contrary, put every sign and everything in its place. So it's talking about different types of human types. So it's in, in one sense, in the Bible, we see everybody's created in the image of God and right. we see man being male or female. But with Islam, we see something slightly different. We don't see man being male or female. We see male, one category, we see female, one category, we see slaves, one category, and we, this verse divides it up even further into different colors, that's one category, different languages, a different category. So we're starting to see a real breakdown mm -hmm. of categories that did not exist previously, and we don't see this in the biblical scriptures, it is really coming down to coloration, it's part diversity. Of the, yeah, it's part of the ordered society that we were talking All about right. before. So there is an order, there is, a differences that should be respected and Muslim apologists would say well hopefully that despite your differences you would get together and this is one of the wonderful purposes of Islam but it's very very different from Christianity I think that's what I'm trying to hit home okay excellent yeah. all right yeah we, we see this again in Surah 49 13 it talks about peoples and tribes so again, differentiating between different particular people. There you have, create you, male for female, made you peoples and tribes. Yes. We're gonna, we've got that up on the screen there. You'll see it's defined there. And that's category, again, the categories you're pointing out to, these are things that you picked up on. There's, and you'll see, and you're going to unpack it as we go further because yeah. that's going to come into much there's going to be a denigration of certain categories and an elevation of other categories. Yes, yes, we're going to see that as we go okay. on. Okay, let's talk about piety, the importance of piety in all this. Yeah, so um, I'm going to look at Surah 2, Ayah 221. It talks about not marrying a polytheistic women or until they believe. But if you go down, it says a believing slave is better than a polytheist. And so we see, um, remember we're talking about ordered society, at the bottom normally would be the slaves. Right. Um, but it's saying if you're pious, if you're a believing person, then you can go up and you can marry them even though they are um, a believing, even though they are a slave. So piety does become imper imperative here. Yeah. A, be a believing slave is better than a polytheist, all right? And when we go to Sunan ibn Majah. Again, we see the same sort of formulation, do not marry women for their beauty, which may destroy them or for their money, which may corrupt them for religion. A slit-nosed black slave woman, if pious, is preferable. Oh dear, just the yeah. description there. 
Yeah. So you can see again that piety is elevated. Right. Um, and they think of the worst possible thing, which would be a slit nosed black slave woman. Even that. That's they the put hardest. That, they put that right you're the of worst them. of the worst. Yeah. As long as she's pious, she's okay. And the worst of the worst Would includes be. your color, includes you being as a slave, includes your physical features. Like the nose. Yeah. That's I mean, fashion. if you think back, Jay, when we looked at the Bible, did we see anything like this? No, no. Talking about facial features, no, talking about color. We don't see anything like that. So even when we're talking about... No denigration about, at no. all. This is start, so we're starting to see this kind of language being used. Yeah. So even when you have slaves, within those slaves, there's categories and right at the bottom, they, the one they can think of is a slit-nosed black slave woman. Fascinating. I mean, it's, not, it's, it's horrendous when you stop to think, the, uh, the, of course, the impact that's going to have or the implications that it has. Mm. Well, let's continue on. Yeah, we see Ibn Hazm writing in the 11th century. He says, God has decreed that the most devout is the noblest, even if he be a negress. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say the even, word. Even, <laughs> even if he is the negress's bastard. <laughs> you said it. I mean, it's fascinating. Even, there's the, yeah. the worst of the worst the is... The worst of the worst. So when we say Negro, they're talking about a black woman. Right. And then the worst... The bastard saying, would be the illegal, the illegitimate child. And remember, Jay, it's up to the slave owner. If, so if, the, if the, the father of the child is the slave owner, it's up to him whether he wants to um, accept the child as his son or not. He can simply say, this is not my son. And then that's what the child becomes. And it's, it just seems horrendous. Yeah. It seems absolutely horrendous. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Okay, let's now, let's move on to um, the farewell sermon now. Let's move on to good old Muhammad himself. Yeah, so when I'm talking with my Muslim friends um, and pointing out these issues where it, it degenerates blackness, um, I point out the fact that they point out to me, well, he cannot be racist because of his farewell sermon. He talks about the fact that no Arab is better than a black man and a slave is not better than a free man. So this is the example they give all the time. And I've heard this before, yeah. that this is how, if you look at his farewell sermon, this puts Muhammad in the right tone, in the right light. This is the Muhammad they love. This is the prime example. This shows that he is all things to all people, almost like a Christ-like figure. And mm -hmm. they always point to this sermon. We're going to look at it now, uh, written, uh, given to us by Musnad Ahmad ibn Habla. Go ahead, let's pull and unpack it. And what did you find there? Well, I, I can read it. It says, someone who heard the sermon of the Messenger of Allah in the middle of the days of at Tashriq narrated to me that he said, O people, indeed your Lord is one and your Father is one. Indeed, there is no superiority of an Arab over a non-Arab, nor of a non-Arab over an Arab, nor of a white over a black, nor of a black over a white, except by taqwa. Have I conveyed the message? Okay. And they say this is the final sermon. We find this in Ibn Majah. And it's very, very hard to find in the English, by the way, but we do find it in, in the Arabic and I've had it translated. It is there in the Arabic in Ibn Majah. It's very similar to Galatians 3.28. It is. It is um, very similar. And I should point out that, that even though it's one of the six Sahih Hadith, Ibn Majah, it's the least authentic of the six. Um, and it comes at the latest time. But the interesting thing so about this... So it would be the weakest. It's the weakest out of the six, Sahih. Right, okay. But what's interesting about this farewell sermon is that Tabari, he also narrates the farewell sermon of Muhammad. And he says something slightly different. Okay. He says this, Listen to my words, O people, for have I conveyed the message? Know for certain that every Muslim is a brother of another Muslim and that all Muslims are brethren. It is not lawful for one person to take from his brother except this which was given to him willingly. So do not wrong yourselves. Oh, well, have I not conveyed the well, message? this is completely different. Yeah, it's, it's very different. It this talks is about, supposed to be the same sermon. Well, this is it. I mean, um, Tabari, he was the one who wrote the histories. Well, listen, Tabari is writing in the 10th century. Hanbal is writing in the 11th century. So there's been a change between the 10th and 11th century. Well, this is the problem. Tabri is writing the histories, he's writing earlier, and nowhere in his writings do we find what Han Hanbal says. So Hanbal has changed it, or someone has changed it, and Hanbal has recorded it. Yeah. About a century later, much more 
benign and benevolent. Yeah. They've sanitized it. We don't find it in Sahih Bukhari. We don't find it in Sahih Muslim. <laughs> Someone showed him a Bible. <laughs> Someone actually read to him Galatians 3.28 yeah, and he exactly. wanted to get the equivalent and add to it and put it into the, I'm being speculating yeah, obviously, yeah. but there, it, it is curious that it's if you look into suspicious. the 10th and 11th, that the 10th century, the earlier version, is nothing like the 11th century, and it's just saying, a Muslim for another Muslim. There's nothing about slavery there. There's no, but nothing about equality um, there. Arab and non-Arab. No, or Arab like or non-Arab. It's very much, you are of, of uh, your own kind. And this is in keeping what we find in the Muslim text where it talks about um, differ differentiating between Muslims and non-Muslim, the killing of a Muslim or the, the freeing of a believing slave, which we'll come on to. The belief is very important. If you're a Muslim, it's very important. It doesn't talk about Arab, non-Arab in, in yeah, many yeah. of the sources. So we, I do find this very curious, and I don't, I, I don't put much weight on it. I'm just wondering then this distinction, this difference, the, the change between the 10th and 11th century, mm. could this have come about because of their interaction with Christians? Possibly, who knows? Maybe <laughs> between the 10th and 11th, maybe Han, uh, or the, the, the one that we see um, with, with um, Hanbal must have come about because not only did he know and learn and find out about the Bible or heard Christians saying the same thing, they wanted to find the like with like. And you can mm. see, well, your Jesus says this, this is what Mar Muhammad says. See, very much the same. Well, you know what, Jay, I think you have a point because as we go on and we look at how the slavery played out in Islamic lands, there was an acceptance that there were non-Arabs who were equally as Muslim. There was these debates, you know, what does it mean to be a Muslim? Do Arabs have superiority? Especially when they were including the Berbers and yep. you know, Egyptians and people like that the Persians so there was this discussion going on in the later periods so that could yeah that could well be a well, thousand years before that Jesus said much better greater <laughs> things they're finally catching up takes them a thousand years to catch up but give them time they'll get there okay yeah. so to sum up we see that piety outweighs um, whiteness um, and outweighs blackness impiety outweighs whiteness so you can be the son of a prophet but if you're in if you don't have piety then it's a bad thing but it's just interesting that the lowest thing they can think of is not Would be just the black one. yeah, not just a slave, but a black slave. You said earlier that Islam came to correct slavery, to emancipate slavery, to eradicate slavery. This is what my Muslim friends have told me. I've heard the same thing. So mm. what what do we say to that? Well, when I speak to them, they give me this particular ayah. It's ayah twenty four thirty three. So, surah twenty four, ayah thirty three. The emancipation verse is what you're calling it. Okay, yeah. let's read it. Let's yeah. see if it I is. have a question mark over that. I can see that. <laughs> that means you're not quite convinced yourself. No. Let's see why you're not convinced. It says this, um, but let not those who find them the means for marriage abstain from sexual relations until Allah enriches them from his bounty. And those who seek a contract um, for eventual emancipation, it says in the brackets. Every time we see that in the Quran, that means your right hand possessor, that means it's your slave of war. So that, just so people know that. Yeah, no, that's ahead. very helpful. Um, so if they want to seek to make a contract, then make a contract with them if you know that there is within them goodness and give them from the wealth of Allah which he has given you. And it goes on from there. If they come to an agreement with their slave owner, that they could um, agree in amounts and pay it off and then they'd be freed. The word here is emancipated. It doesn't actually say that in the Arabic, but it also talks about the fact that if you find goodness within them, mm. so whose decision is it to find goodness in them and what exactly does that mean? Some people have said, well, if they have a trade, they can actually go out into the world and they can do a trade and they are good with their hands or they can, they can do a trade. Then if they can survive on the outside, then you're going to be able to find goodness with them and then you can let them go. <coughs> um, it's all dependent on the slave owner. And there, there, we wouldn't really call this true emancipation then. It's not emancipation because when we're saying emancipation, we're saying without conditions. That's right. You're free. You're freeing them. But it's not saying that at all. It's saying that the they slave owner. They almost have owner, to prove their worth in, in this yeah, case. The slave owner has to decide whether they're good enough. And even if they don't, even if they decide they're good enough, some commentators still say you don't have, you know, you can't force the slave owner to let them go. So for Ayah 92. This is a guidance for freeing on slaves. Yes, so we're going to see this in a couple of ayahs that we're going to look at, um, where it talks about freeing a believing slave um, if something is done. For in, in this example, we see this. 
It is never for a believer to kill a believer except by mistake, and whoever kills a believer by mistake, then freeing a believing slave and a compensation payment presented to the de de deceased family unless they give it up as a right of charity. And so if somebody is killed, if a believer is killed, then what do you do? You free a slave. <laughs> a human for a human, but in this case, the slave has no choice, but you free him. So when you say free a slave, what do you mean? Well, we're going to come on to that, um, exactly what we mean when we say free a slave. But the Quran, on the surface, it looks like it's just letting them well, go. Well, this is great, and this is what Muslims have always said, haven't they? Yeah. See, we free slaves whenever yeah. we have to pay, for, to pay for something. We let a slave go. In other words, we're taking, we incurring some costs to ourselves. Yeah, because a slave is your money, so you are getting, you're, you're allowing some money just to go away. You could, you could tire the slave out, as Muhammad often did, but if you just free the slave, then you're not going to get the income. Or it says you can, it goes on further down. Um, it says whoever does not find a slave or can afford one, then fast for two months. Okay, so, so <laughs> a slave, a life of a slave is equal to two days, two months of fasting. Fast for two months. <laughs> so that's the worth of a slave right there. Yeah, and think about the family who are due the compensation. Yeah. Um, if, if you're fasting for two months, are you going to get the compensation? No. <laughs> so it doesn't really make sense. But in terms of freeing the slave, it just seems like it's just money. There's no change in heart. There's no desire because you see intrinsic value in that person that you're letting them go. It's just a monetary decision. Okay. We see pretty much the same in 58, um, 3 and 4, where um, if there's an issue between the wives, um, you've said that they're like a sister to me or like a mother to me, and then you want to go back on what you've said, then you have to free a slave. You have to free a slave. And so we're not, <laughs> again, it's just used um, as a way of compensation. All right. So the slave is there at the behest of the slave owner to be used to negotiate problems that they have in their own lives. Yeah, so it's just like you're, you're bartering with goods. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I've done this to you, all right, I'll give you a slave. You're not actually thinking about the person of the slave, of no, the, no. the person at all. Think back, Jay, when we did that session on slavery and Christianity, and you were to love the slave as you love yourself, or you're to love um, a foreigner as you love yourself in your land. In the Old Testament. In the it's Old fascinating. Testament. You give them all the rights that a, that a Jew gets, so does a slave get yeah. as a stranger in the land. I mean, we see, we see something of the slave gets injured and there's, you know, there's a requirement to pay for uh, any kind of compensation. Mm -hmm. But we don't see any the slaves being bartered back and forth like no, they're, no. they're cheap cattle. We Absolutely. don't see that at all. We still no. see intrinsic human value. What a contrast. Well, good thing you brought that up. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. We don't see that here in Islam. And we see this again here. It's talking about the fact that if you are, if you're breaking an oath, it's, it, it's expiation is the feeding of 10 needy people from the average of that which you feed your own family or clothing them or the freeing of a slave. So you can either do the religious duty mm -hmm. or you can just pay compensation. Does pay 10, pay, <laughs> feed 10 needy people <laughs> of what you normally feed if you feed your family in a day, yeah. feed 10 nor, uh, normal people or, get, or, or give away a slave. Yeah, where's, where's the change in heart? No, there's nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing so all. they really are just seen as goods. They're just goods. Remember, we looked at the Aristine, Aristotle, um, Aristotle's Aristotelian. Um, yeah, that's the word. Um, description of a slave, mm. and he just says, you know, a slave can be like a garden rake, a garden hoe, um, anything is just an instrument. It's Here, a commodity. Just a commodity. To Here, uh, give and take, buy and sell. It's, it doesn't really have intrinsic value. We see that here. Even though we see in other places it talks about, you know, feed them off your food and clothe them. But when it comes down to it, if you do something wrong, you just get rid of that slave, you just mm -hmm. free them. It's expendable. Or, and I'm almost saying it rather yeah. than he or she. Yeah. It becomes an it almost, doesn't it? You don't, you're not it even, takes away personality. Are you even worried about this person that you're sending out into the world? Are you giving them any kind of money or setting them up with a home that they can go to? You're just sending them out. Nothing like what we see in the biblical context where no. you must feed them, you must take care of them, they become part of the family, you, do, you don't treat, even if they're strangers, they are then get all the rights that a yeah. Jew gets. Yeah, so yeah, I mean they would feed them because they want you to work, you have to eat, mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to feed them and it says, you know, clothe them the same way, but we do see an important difference with the way they're just bartered and traded and freed and 
not much care seems to be given at all. Now, the, the word that is given for free, freeing somebody is manumission. Yes. What do you know about manumission? So manumission is very, very different from the word emancipation. So even when we were using the word emancipation, it was in the square brackets, which means it's not actually in the Arabic. The word is manumission. Manumission means I set you free. I, as the slave owner, am making an individual decision to set you individual slave free. So I'm not saying widespread, there's no more slavery, all my slaves are free. I'm saying you particular slave, I set you free. You, you're free. Okay. So that's the difference. When we talk about emancipation, like what happened in 1807 um, with the transatlantic slave trade, worldwide, the British government said no more slavery, okay. <laughs> no more slave trade. So it was not individual. Manumission is individual. Manumission is individual by the individual slave owner. Depending on the circumstances. Yeah. Like we've just seen in, in Surah 2 and Surah 58, yeah. we've just been looking at examples where they're, they're, being, they're being set free because of a problem that needs to be negotiated. Yeah. It's a negotiated settlement. Yeah, we don't find the Islamic caliphate, any one of them, setting all slaves So when Muslims free. say these are verses of emancipation, no, they're not. No, they're not. There's no emancipation here. There's no, no wholesale freeing of slave. There's no eradication of slavery itself or the institution. It still exists. Slaves are still being bartered. This one is maybe set free. That one is being set free. And that's all these verses are saying, mm -hmm. are, is when to do it. Yes. It's giving the condition. Yeah, it's, it's giving the background. It's the law. It's just part of the. There it is, and it's nothing more. Giving this because of this problem, eradicating this because of this problem. You give the slave freedom. So that's not emancipation. That's nothing more than manumission. Yeah, it's okay. manumission. So we need to get our categories, <laughs> yeah. and that's good for people to remember that. So when you're in a discussion with Muslims and those Muslims who are watching this, when you say this is an emancipation, these are verses on emancipation. These are not. Get the definition correct. You are not emancipating, you're not eradicating slavery. There's no abolition of slavery in any of this. No. This is just nothing more than rules. So that if you have this problem, give the slave away. Or you have that problem, allow this slave his freedom or her freedom. That's all it's saying. Manumission is the word they should be using. Yeah. Uh, we're, and we're not looking for a manumission. We're looking for eradication. That's we're looking for abolition. We're looking for emancipation. Now, this has been so good. We need to wrap this up here. We're going to uh, kind of bring it down to conclusion. Mm -hmm. Kind of, um, so we looked at the treatment of slavery. We've looked at what the Quran says specifically. We're now moving into the Islamic side of slavery. And we're looking for these claims because the Muslims have made these claims that Islam was sent, that Muhammad was sent, the Quran was sent uh, as an eradication. One of the reasons is to eradicate slavery, that previous slavery that had existed, uh, of course, in, uh, of course, had, had European slavery hadn't even come onto the world stage yet. Oh, no. So this is long before European slavery, but the slavery of, of the Greek slavery, the Roman slavery, all the slavery that existed, Islam was sent to eradicate that. I don't think Muslims realize, they don't look at the dates, they don't realize that for 700 years before the Europeans even got into slavery, they were doing it. But what was fascinating is, they, uh, they make this claim that they came to eradicate it, but yet when we've looked at the biblical text, and now we've looked at the Quranic text, and we've looked at the Quran, we're finding that this is not, there's no equivalent. The biblical text was much more benign. It was had a much yeah. better category. It really saw slaves as part of the community. The slaves were there as part, sometimes even part of the family. Even the str though they were seen as strangers, they were not treated as strangers. Whereas in this case, in every case, they are not part of the community. There, there's, there is a denigration. You're seeing already in words and languages that are used to show that they are at the bottom of the heap. Uh, that they, in com when they're using comparatives, you've used examples of comparatives. They were at the bottom of the comparative. So show already that they're seen as the least of the least, the lowest of the low. Uh, and of course, the descriptions will get more livid as we go into it. But certainly this idea of emancipation that Muslims always talk about, this abolition does not exist. We're talking about manumission, yes, not manumission. emancipation. This is just one slave here because you need to get a problem over here. Nothing, no, so far, I've not seen anything that convinces me that this is emancipation, this is eradication or abolition. We're going to continue this. We're going to now look at the treatment of slaves in Islam. We're going to unpack that. It's not going to be very pretty, but we need to get back to that. Stay with us. Uh, this is Jay here in London with Sarah Foster at The Jay Show. Over and out.